You know, looking at a man that's fresh out of state prison after a decade. You're also looking at a man that's destined for greatness never to come back. Take a walk with us. Ten toes down, never ran, never fold. Talking to the bros like we gotta break the moon. Then we gon' shine like that glitter and that gold. I still be checking if they following. DM cool, but I'm pulling up and hollering. Different clothes, why you think she pulling up and hollering? We had a long night, now she going back to modeling. Trying to make it out, watching everything I spend. Know that you could lose your life every time you bend. Just because he throw it up, that don't mean that he your friend. Back like I never left, fresh about that ten. Long days, cold nights, stuck up in the pen. He a rat. If he told once, he do it again. Shorty said she love you. Shorty know how to pretend. She just trying to survive. Hey, how y'all doing? Peace. It's the King So Rich, also known as Richard Paul. And today we have a very special fresh out interview for you. First and foremost, I have the brother, the brother who I've had an honor to meet, Professor Terrence Coffey, here with me. And we'll be getting into his story, which is extremely powerful from prison to professor. But also, we have some of the young kings from Strong Youth with us here today. Strong is an organization based on Long Island. It's a youth, family, and community development organization that focuses on street gang and gun violence. And I'm honored, I'm proud to have these young kings here sharing this moment with us. One thing we speak about at Fresh Out, when we, when we talk about the trials and tribulations that we experience in prison, is not to glorify those stories, but rather to share them with the people with the hopes that our communities and particularly our young people can learn from our mistakes so they don't have to walk down those same hallways that we did. So with that being said, um, this brother is amazing. I could speak to a million of his accolades, but I don't believe in telling other people's stories. So I'm gonna let this brother introduce himself. Professor Coffey, um, could you please give the people a brief introduction of who you are and why you're here today. Well, thank you so much, my brother. It's an honor to be here. Uh, it's a privilege to be here uh, and to be perfectly honest, it's a blessing uh, to be here. Uh, my name is Professor Terrence Coffey of New York University. Um, I currently teach forensic justice and problem solving course along with a host of other uh, subject matters. Um, I have several published articles and uh, USA Today, Forbes magazine that addresses some of the complexities surrounding our criminal uh, justice system as well as juvenile and racial justice here uh, in America. Uh, I, I usually say things like this purposely in spaces like this for the reason of, you know, particularly with these young men you have here today. Yes. Uh, I graduated at the top of my class. Uh, I was named the NSAW Student of the Year, uh, President Service Award recipient, uh, Excellence in Leadership Award recipient, and we can go down the list of accolades uh, when I say all that, but my name is also Terrence Coffey, E604958, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, and that mm -hmm. didn't come from, you know, <laughs> no military backdrop or anything. Uh, I got that after spending over 19 years in six prison beds uh, uh, in our correctional uh, institution and system here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, when I'm in spaces uh, like this, particularly uh, after, you know, or being in the space I am in my life today, uh, most people may ask me from the beginning to the end, you know, how all this occurred. Well, I, I think there were three points, Rich, that, I, that are critical to me uh, that I have to share, particularly with these young men, because prior to everything I just described to you, uh, my last prison bid was in uh, 2008, uh, and I was facing a, a, an assault charge with a deadly weapon, uh, they was they was gonna hit me because I already had the, the time in, so they was gonna bring me back on the 30 flat. And now mm. I'm about to do 30 flat, and I'm, mm. I'm yeah, uh. So you got no ump me and where we're from, you know, the uh, ump, that kind of pain. <laughs> yeah. uh, I remember going to my hearing, I remember coming back, 
Uh, and I remember going to my cell, and there's a, for, for anybody who know, you know, when you go to that, that hearing, they say some crazy numbers, you, you kind of get that sick thing where when you get back, all you want to do is go, go to the cell and you just want to lay down. Mm -hmm. You want to try to act like it was a dream, but it ain't really a dream because then it's reality and you wake up to this reality. Mm -hmm. And it's a reality you can't change now uh, because it's one thing, you know, before the action, there's another one after the action, there's a whole another one when you're in the back of the seat, and there's a whole another one when you're in front of the judge. Then so the story changes once you're in the cell and you realize you're in the trap now. Mm -hmm. um, and in that space, I remember, and I'm not a religious man, so I don't get, you know, I don't promote that. I, I, I believe in the universe. I remember praying to the universe because, and I wasn't praying that uh, I didn't get the time. <clears throat> that they were talking about because I knew I was going to the you know the penitentiary what I was praying is that they didn't give me that much time mm -hmm. I can it. don't give me that I can deal with everything but that and my mama used to always tell me when I was coming up because uh, uh, I grew up in foster homes and this is where I had to learn to fight as a child I didn't want to fight I had to fight um, I got bullied a lot and it was through through that, that it's either you're gonna keep getting chased home or you're gonna fight. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn to fight real fast. But that type of engagement was also connected to some other things that led me by the time I was seven, you know, 17, I was off the porch and I was already selling coke. And by the time I was 20, I was in the penitentiary for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm saying all that because after that prayer that my mama words came to me, she said to me, one day you're gonna get yourself in something you can't get out of. And that was my reality that day. It was a reality because I had already been in the penitentiary six times. I already had did all the gunplay. I had already did, <laughs> did that, let me just say it that way. Mm -hmm. And it was about three weeks later that I got a call. They called me up to the, uh, the officer station and they told me to pack my stuff. And that's not the word they use. I'm just saying for the sake of the interview. Uh, and you know, you always gonna ask that question and once you're in the penitentiary, where I'm going, but you know where you're going. Let me ask you a question. Shoot. What's the word they use? Oh, that shit, pack your shit. Pack your shit. Pack your shit. Uh -huh. <laughs> pack your shit. And when he said it, you know, cause when you got the kind of charges I had, they kind of, they start, you know, you go to what we call general population, but mm -hmm. based upon the degree of your charge, you're going to get started moving to what we call those, 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 those gladiator cells. And the gladiator cells is other gladiators mm -hmm. who gladiators. Mm -hmm. So you already know when you about to go pike your shit, yeah. you already know where you going. So you already know then it's time to put on game face. Cause there ain't no plan. Now you can, you can bust it up. Well, you going where it's at for real. It's time to gladiate. It's time to gladiate. 24-7, you're going to gladiate. It ain't no, that is what it is. Um, and I remember walking up and I went to the office and you know, they told me to pack my shit. And I'm going to ask the question, oh, where I'm going? <laughs> and these were the words that changed, that was one of the things that changed my life when they told me the charges against you being dropped for that. However, I still had that rest to do. And while sitting on November the 4th, 2008, I was sitting in Gainesville Correctional Institution. And that's when I learned uh, the officers that night allowed us to sit up to see the presidential election. And it was the first, uh, and, and it, you know, Barack Obama was running and I think they just let us sit up because it's gonna be an insult to see, you know, all this go down the way it was gonna go down. And uh, I remember sitting there and uh, on that night, Barack Obama was elected president. And I'm sitting in the, in, 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 in the day room mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm sitting there like, I'm. Like I'm crying as a, as a, as a, I'm, 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 I'm tatted up for real. You know, I ain't get no ink, you know, I ain't got the, 
Ain't you? Mine came from where they say get in the blood for real. Yeah. Mine came from that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there crying because I'm looking at this dude like, and he has now de defied everything that the world ever told me about me being black, about me being from the hood, about me being a nigga, about me being, and I always say that because there's a book I, I read, but it became a life to me when I was uh, in uh, 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 James Baldwin's Fire Next Time. Mm -hmm. And in this passage, Mr. Baldwin writes, you can only be defeated by becoming or believing what the white world calls a nigga. Mm. And for the first time, the world is like everything that the world told me I was, I could ever be, that I could ever aspire to be. That, that they told me uh, I got to accept mediocrity. I have no aspiration to excellence. Set them. And in that moment, it's seeing Barack Obama, it's like everything that I ever believed that somebody told me about me, it's like, it's just broke. Mm. And the pain that I carried in my life broke. Because I was told that my whole life. Mm. Society told me that. They said it through their little jokes. They said it in the hood I grew up in. They said it, other black folk told me that. Partners told me that. Everybody who was stuck in the space that I was stuck in told me that. So it was always uh, 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 conditioned and believed, and to me to believe, that was it. I didn't think I was supposed to live past 25. I come from the Tupac era. It's me against the world. Fuck the world. I was bred in that. And it's not that I was, I was, I was, I wanted to be that. To be perfectly honest, it was like that's what the world always told me I could be and ever be. And I believed that. So that's where they came up. It was always said that young black men from my neighborhoods ain't gonna live past 25. That didn't just start. Mm. They told us that uh, way back in the days. A lot, a lot of what your young men at today, the they had been start telling us we ain't gonna live past 21. You ain't gonna make it past 26. You ain't gonna make it past. So you already live a life expecting to survive to die. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Not you fine. live a life surviving but expecting to die. Hmm. You live a life surviving but expecting to die. It's almost like you're not really living at all. You ain't living at all. You exist. Fact. I got out of prison in uh, 2009, man. And because of that, and uh, that incident in reading that book and Barack Obama, it's like I couldn't even engage with the world the same no more. I couldn't even engage with myself no more like that. I couldn't engage no more like in the penitentiary when I was there. We couldn't even engage on that no more. Cause mm. it's like my world has shifted. Shit changed. Like, like yesterday, if you would have called me 24 hours before, if Barack Obama would have lost that election, I would have believed, okay, yeah, they was right, we ain't shit. That's my reality. But when that happened, man, my world shifted, man, because it was the first time I got to see myself in a whole different light than what the world had told me. Mm. That I believe. See, let me tell you the back, dude. Let me, let me say this. There's nothing wrong. A lie is a lie. The most dangerous thing about a lie is when you accept the lie to be the truth. That's when it's dangerous. And for black and brown communities across this country, policies, legislation, conditions, environmental factors, family structure, all that shit tell us we ain't shit. That's in our part. I mean, that's, that's why we say that. Shit, you ain't shit. We say it in like, you ain't shit. 
But underneath that, like Tekosi Coast says in his in his book, Me Against the World, I'm trying to kill the ugly blackness that I see in you that's in me. Because they told me it was ugly and once I won't kill me, I'm trying to kill the ugly in me by killing you. That's where gunplay come from. <laughs> I would say something so, so, so controversial, but I'm not for this space. And I promise you that. But I think about things like that. And, and if you don't live through what we have lived through as a people, and I don't want to go too far back because I don't want that to disconnect from where we're at today. Because everything that we see today in black and brown communities is only something that was passed on from one generation to the next. We call it, uh, what we like to refer to, we talk about generational poverty in, 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 in the span of just money. Mm -hmm. But generational poverty is actually passed down through the way and concept of the way we believe and think and see things. And do things. That's why you'll always see young, 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 young men in our neighborhood always dressed alike because it was passed down for one person. Said da da da. That's why you see mothers dressing their little kids like men. You know how we would be on the. Yeah. He's already internalizing that mm. from him. The problem with the black community and gun on gun, you know, uh, uh, black crime and whatever they want to say, gun violence, that didn't start with our young men shooting at it today. That, is, that, no, oh, no. That started. That been started. You cannot fix a 300 year problem. <laughs> in 10 days by with no reactionary response of coming in our communities that have been marginalized, oppressed, broken down, told you ain't this, told you ain't that, 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 that. And how that is reflected in things we see around us. We internalize it. Subconsciously, in the studies that I do in research, we subcon subconsciously absorb these messages that are told us, and you guys end up, and I say it again, that's why we can always feel like we ain't shit, ain't gonna never be shit. You and I can talk about the aspirations of college and achievement and et cetera, but if we be real and we ask our young black men, they'll, they'll, they'll say yeah for the sake of saying yeah for us because we're in the space, but internally, fuck is you talking about man so it's normal for them to think about oh yeah just go to college i'm gonna go to uscla i'm gonna go to nyu i'm gonna go to heart it's normal for them it's a normal conversation and that is in the structural makeup of our communities and our young men who absorb messages and they some of them don't even know it T Tupac had a song say that's just the way it is. I don't know if any of y'all like that. Remember that? But if we grow up and you ask uh, some of y'all men feel like when they see the world around us, that's just the way it is. What the? F that's just the way it is. It is the absolute is. of no out. That's just the way it is. And that just the way it is means I'm trapped in this space where I have no way to. That shift, after I got out, led me to a program here in New York because at this point in my life, uh, I'm also one of those cats because I come from, you know, I come from a bike in the days. We tell cats, it ain't no thugging after 30. Mm -hmm. Ain't no thugging after 30. If you rocking the same way a, a, a 20 year old rocking at 30, 35, 40, it ain't nothing wrong with jit. It's something wrong with you, playboy. You clown. <laughs> Jit being jit. But what that also implies, to be quite honest with you, is that what we call a developmental disorder in older black men who come. Cause see, let me tell you, I'm, the, I'm this type of G. What we see our young men at today, they are trying to survive the reality that we left them to survive because by the time the 94 crime bill came, all of us was in the penitentiary. So we blame our young men for trying to survive what they don't even understand. Mm. All they're doing is trying to survive. The best way to do it. They, on instinct. 
That's why you hear most crimes when, when you, we, we think, man, that was so true. They instinct. They survive. We, we, we learn to survive on our instinct. But sometimes our instincts in the moment, because of cultural condition and beliefs, can find us in situations that that shit. You you know you pay on a you pay on a life you pay on a, a, a lifetime payment on a. So I delve into these conversations at various levels, at the micro, meso, and uh, legislative levels. As I got out of prison, I got into this, 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 this program that you and I discussed earlier. Yes. Uh, and I got into this program because when you kind of come from where I come from, you already understand two things are either going to happen. You're going to live or die. It comes down to that if you live what we, you know what I mean? It ain't no, you know, some people think it's like this gray area. I don't know. I ain't never lived in the gray area. You can be a living dead or you're going to be dead dead. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. That's it. And we see it in our communities. We see the living dead. People just heal. Just heal. I live it. I live it. For the first time, I see it. I, I think in the beginning, when I started this journey to where here, this started with me mainly just afraid because I didn't just want to go back to the penitentiary. I couldn't, I couldn't even see myself doing penitentiary time no more. It didn't even make, time made sense to me now. Time made sense to me. How old were you at this time? Oh man, I was at, what, 39 now. So at that point, how much years in the system did you spend? 19, I had already did over 19 years. Six prison beds. Mm. Mm. Six prison beds. I'm the type of cat when you go do that, do that lick, it, you know how they tell you, oh, you're gonna do, uh, uh, you're gonna do, you're gonna do uh, 10 on that there. You said I can do that shit standing on my head. I was that cat. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Man, after that shift, man, I'm telling you, it's like my spirit came alive in a way that I could see the world like I'm not a religious dude, but they got this thing. I read the Bible. I like, you know you got too many books in the chain game. <laughs> Except the Bible and yeah. Iceberg Slim and <laughs> Tony Kadeen Coops and all them. And I remember uh, reading the Bible and they said that, I think it was Moses, somebody scales fell off his eyes and he was able to see. <laughs> it's like I had been living in this world the whole time, like, but looking at it through a, through something. It was like it was blurred. I couldn't see it, but I knew it was there, but I couldn't see it because I wasn't a part of it. It's like I, I could see it, but I couldn't touch it. Mm -hmm. Feel me? Mm -hmm. It's like restaurants I go into now. <laughs> restaurants I go into now, they wouldn't have never allowed my, my black ass into. Mm -hmm. Let me be real. Let me be real. Please. Now I walk into restaurants and they greet me. Professor Coffee is so... And in my mind, when I'm sitting in there, sometimes I have someone, uh, maybe it's a bomb or whoever, walk by, and I look through the window, I see them walking. And people know I'm known to get up, go out to the restaurant, go in, give them money, and people see me, I walk back in and they look. Because what they don't know, whether he was the bomb or he was black, I was the one just like him. They wouldn't have never, that, wouldn't, that was off limits. Mm. When I got involved with that program, <clears throat> the only thing I didn't want to do was go back to the chain gang. Mm -hmm. Nothing more than that. I didn't know what come after that, but I knew, I knew not going to the chain gang was in the play. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what success was. I didn't know none of that. I just knew I had a GED. I didn't want to go back to the penitentiary. And I'm sitting here after doing 19, uh, over 19 years locked up uh, in my life, six prison beds, and I'm sitting here trying to figure out how I'm going to live life. That type of... Trying to figure it out. Just at 39. 
Then they're 40. At 39, I'm trying to figure out how to live at 39. That's how life, it sucked the life out of me. Mm. Cause mama, got mama, wasn't supposed to make it past 21. <laughs> wasn't supposed to make it past 20, 25, 26. Now I'm still alive in a world that I don't even like, 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 oh. You didn't even expect to be. What? I'm him. So I knew going back to the chain game wasn't even no option. Cause mm -hmm. now that I understand time, I can't see spending the day in a whole day talking about walking no fucking yard. Is you serious? That shit didn't even make sense no more. Mm. Didn't make no sense. Do you realize, man, we go out to the yard, we just walk around in circles. That's called walking the yard. You just walk around all day, you walk around in the same circle, but let me give you the, the paradox and the parallel. Think about the communities that we live in that we walk around in the same block. <laughs> mm -hmm. Think about it. Condition to walk around in the same block. When I started this, as I said, the whole purpose for me at that juncture was not to go back to the chain game, no matter what. And in the process of it, they asked me to take a, uh, some type of placement test, a college. Uh, first it was the tape test, and then I guess I scored so well, on, they wanted me to take a college placement test at uh, John Jay for this program with John Jay because they said it helped people, you know, who got formerly incarcerated to get in school. And uh, at that time, my mom, now I'm, about, I'm going on 40 now. So what was happening, so, so many of the young, young jits started coming in who was like 21 and 20. And in my mind, I'm trying to figure out, yo, how the hell is a 20 year old homeless? The fuck that happened in 20 years? 20, first 20 years, I was already in the penitentiary. But what we started finding, a lot of these young men were aging out of foster care and they was just dropping them off. Throwing them to the world. Grew up in foster care without their mama, without their daddy, uh, treated like shit. Then you get to, and they just drop. Swim, nigga. And you know how you can look in, even when I was here, they don't know it. I was looking at some of these young men. I was talking uh, to Miss Jean. I was just looking at them, man, because I remember the, 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 the spaces they used to send me. We didn't have stuff like this. They cut that shit out in the 80s because they were talking about the welfare baby. So they figured all the black people and the Hispanic people, we was using all the money to buy drugs and shit. So they cut all the money out. Y'all won't get no type of after school program. Y'all won't get nothing. Get it how you live. So when I was looking at them, it was like I was looking at myself like, whew. whew. So when I took that placement test, I, I just took the test. I don't know, like in, in prison, they have you go take the test, the tape test, or whatever, and all you want to do is Christmas tree because all you're trying to do is take the little test get out and get out to get the hell on back to the dorm and get back to the yard. But this time I just, I, I, I took the test. Uh, and I, from that test, I, my, the score that I had was so high that they contacted New York University <laughs> to come in to have it, and, and this is 39, because in my mind, when all this was going on, what I was really thinking, okay, I'm helping these young jits. So I said, like what you, you what the work, the, the beautiful work you do, I said, you know what I'm gonna do, man? I'm gonna become a counselor to help these youth, to keep them from going to the penitentiary. Cause I already know if you 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and you already at a service place. I already know, I already see, I already know the game, nigga. I done played chess with them. Mm -hmm. I know the moves. I already see the setup. And I know that if there's no intervention, whether they understand it or not, the, the trap is already being set. The trap already set. And for those like who kind of move through this shit blindly on instinct, it, it's the trap door. No. Facts. Ask me, I was 20, I can tell you how that shit goes. And when I, so I was in that zone with you. And when I took the test, like I said, they said I scored so high, then they got me into uh, Bronx Community College and they wanted me to take a two year program and 
There I ended up graduating Phi Theta Kappa. I ended up graduating studying in Europe. Uh, and I remember when I got selected to go to Europe and we got there, uh, I'm the only black speck on, a, on the, all, the, all this white snow. And the white people in Germany, they looking at me because they thought I was some kind of sports athlete or I was some kind of basketball player or some shit. Uh, because they could not fathom that a black man was there on the basis of, 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 of educational or academic achievements. When I was actually leading a world conference on poverty, global poverty. Mm. That's what I was doing in Europe. Selected one, what, one of four of 11,000. And that was just the beginning. So by the time um, I graduated in 2014 from there, I had a full scholarship to New York University, uh, awards, accolades, uh, and that's saying uh, it was my uh, graduate uh, program where I obtained my master's degree uh, in social work with the focus in uh, policy and reform. Uh, I began to write articles for USA Today, Forbes Magazine, uh, a lot of these outlets, and People ask me, with all the success that I have, why did you know? Why don't I expand the type of work that I do in regards to uh, justice reform policy and all these other things? But huh, when they ask me that, it's like what you're asking me is to turn my back on myself. Let me ask how it's that. Because in every, each and every person, young black man or young, like whether I meet them or not, the, the work that I do seeks to improve the quality of life for them and their outcome so they don't have to go through the right. Because uh, 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 from a statistical point of view, if we want to talk statistic and research, Statistically, they have already determined that our young black men who are in this space are not, what, eight times more li likely to go to prison. Seven times more likely to get gunned down. And once that happens, one interaction, one interaction with law enforcement will create a trajectory that even if they weren't doing nothing wrong, they're gonna be, they're gonna be addressed that way because now you're gonna took them out of school, then they fall back, then they're going back in, et cetera, et cetera. So we got the statistical data that shows us that. And this isn't just like me thinking this in the moment. This is like a, <laughs> a linear study for over 60 years. So then it just begin with our generation of youth. They just recipients of it. They don't know they recipients of it. Everything that they know and learn and that they do and how they move and how they think, that was passed down to them. Mm. Back to generational poverty in the way we think. But for our youth, and if we don't have these type of conversations to have them challenge that or, or kind of bring it to light to them, what they'll do is assume that it's just the nor it, it, it's, it's normalized. There's no investment. It hurts because I get to walk in these two different spaces in life where I see communities just like our young black men and spank men right now who's sitting in this fucking space right now that is some youth just like them on the other side of the track who, who don't know nothing about this. You know who come and talk to them? I'm going to tell you. They have motherfuckers from NASA come in and talk to their stuff. They got motherfuckers from uh, uh, Microsoft. They have people from uh, uh, development programs that are gonna be there because they already got it there because they're already being fast-tracked to UCLA. They're being fast-tracked to uh, NYU. They're being tracked back to, to Harvard, Columbia. We go down the list. And I'm in those spaces. And it pains me. So when you ask me to do this, That's why I do this. Because mm. I'm going to sit in another space later on this week and I'm going to be talking to some other people who know nothing about 
what we're talking about here tonight. Mm -hmm. Who don't know nothing about being poor? Don't even know nothing about eating no pizza. Somebody offering you know the pizza. Who don't know nothing about us coming here just kick? Don't know nothing about our hoodie game. Don't know none of that. They emulate it, but they ain't that. You know, they want to emulate what you are, but they don't want to be what we are. That's why I don't know if y'all ever look at movies. You ever notice they always trying to replicate who we is for real? You ever caught that? I mean, really stop and think about, have you ever saw how Hollywood, they want to emulate us? Look at TV. That's the value, but we don't catch that. They take our lives, our stories, our pain, our tears, our uh, and they'll, they'll fucking make million dollars off. Monetize it. Monetize our life. And then talk down on us for the way that we live it. And want to live, and want to be. That's why y'all see all, I, you know, you know little, little, what they call them? Little white wiggers, whatever. God forgive me, God. Want to dress like you, judge up, try to be cool. Like, you gotta practice to do it, we just do it. It is. We, it, we just eels. We just eels. But we don't even see the value of who is. When we see other people, we don't try to be like them, they try to be like us. We don't live our life that way. Two factors why. We too busy trying to motherfucking survive. survive. Mm -hmm. We ain't got time to try to be playing no motherfucker. If you come from where I come from, you ain't got time for that. You got time because your life is where it is. You got time to go and play. Well, I'm deciding if I'm gonna do this. I think I'll go to Europe and see I'll find myself. What the fuck do you mean find yourself? We just hope our men don't find themselves in no fucking jail. Or no fucking prison while you off your I'm gonna find myself. Our kids don't get to see that reality. That's true. That's real, no, absolutely. Our kids don't know that reality. They have a fucking trust fund where they can just have and just go like, hey, I'm just gonna go for a year or so to Europe and just, I'm in fucking Europe, I got friends and cop, they just went just to go, just, just to go. And we still, watch this shit, still walking the same blocks of where we live. Pete that. Still walking the same blocks where we live, just like I walk the same blocks in those chain gangs, and that's why everybody else is. And that's why they say the disparity rate where we're at will only wide unless we have spaces like this that we engage and we have to wake up the spirits of our young men to tell them, keep your swag, but you got to see past this fucking illusion. I call it the matrix. Mm. Everybody talk about motion. Everybody really think the Matrix is a game. The Matrix is truly real. You just don't, you got, I'm gonna help you put it together. But you already know that. You already see it. Take the red pill or the blue pill. And a lot of us just took up that pill where we stay disillusioned, afraid to take the other pill. Because the fuck when we take the other pill, You're gonna wake up to a reality, man. And that shit, I'm telling you, it's a harsh reality. But there's a harsher reality. Trust me. So, I use my platform. I have a, uh, my show, uh, it's called For Time on Spotify. Uh, along with the articles, the this, the that, I, you know, in the spaces I teach, um, the work that I do, I speak a lot with organizations and um, I, I was speaking with Miss Gina about how we want to replicate this program, how we need the voices of our young men and you know, and they don't know like, 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 let me tell you, man. When you say replicate when I got, this program, pardon me, when you say replicate this program, what program are you talking about? Here, this space, this, this. This, this work that you're doing here. Imagine if we had men like you and your team here that for what we seeing that they had, our people had somewhere, to, I mean, on real, real talk. Imagine if we had funding and expand that. Imagine when we had our training, we gonna get in here wild out cause we, we, we get down like that. But how about we gonna have to definitely start talking about our career options and dot, 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 I'm, I'm on that. 
So for the viewers who don't know, I'm gonna repeat it. Today we've been blessed to have some young men from Strong Youth with us. Strong is an acronym. It stands for Struggling to Reunite Our New Generation. I've been blessed with the opportunity to be the intervention counselor at Strong. This is also a program where I was once a participant. I was once sitting on the other side of the table just like these young kings and people took the time out of their day, out of their life, um, Sergio Argueta and Razmia Zatar, to be specific, they took the time out of their lives to build with me, to mentor me, um, to speak life into me, to give me tools that I, I, I kept with me throughout my journey. And even after I met them, I still was in the streets, I still went to prison, but they planted seeds in the garden, which is my mind. And when the environment was right, although it was the harshest of environment, <laughs> right? I was in prison, but what the, when the environment was right and the right amount of sunlight was able to peek into my brain and, 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 and it was nourished, right? With that environmental water, those seeds opened up and all the tools that they gave me, I was able to use and I was able to build my mind. And after serving an 11 year sentence in prison, where I studied like, Professor Coffey mentioned, I came home and I put the work in. I put the work in on my own. You know, they supported me, right? I put the work in, I worked my ass off. Um, and then I was afforded the opportunity to be the intervention counselor here and build with these young kings like Serge and Mia once built with me, right? So now, um, once again, I've had the opportunity to bring these young kings from strong youth into this space where we could build with individuals like this brother. And um, hopefully we can all learn off of his lived experience or from my lived experience, but also so we can learn from them, right? This is bilateral, right? So um, with that being said, before we step into our next conversation with Professor Coffey, I would like to open up the floor and step into our perspectives segment where we get the perspectives of the people sitting here in the audience live today, especially our young kings. So during your time in prison, did you study to become a professor or did you really start taking it seriously after that session? Um, it, it, I, it really became serious after my uh, incarceration. Ten toes down, never ran, never fold. Talking to the bros like we gotta break the moon. Then we gonna shine like that glitter and that gold. I still be checking if they following. DM cool, but I'm pulling up and hollering. Different clothes, why you think she pulling up and hollering? We had a long night, now she going back to modeling. Trying to make it out, watching everything I spend. Know that you could lose your life every time you bend. Just because he throw it up, that don't mean that he your friend. Back like I never left, fresh about that. Stuck up in the pen, he a rat If he told once, he do it again Shorty said she love you, shorty know how to pretend She just tryna survive, you a mean